technically Edward George Barrett. Boy, you look good, man. Well, when all of a sudden did you get this thing going? Well, you know, I would grow a beard every winter and then shave it before spring training started. And so this spring I said, let me grow it out, see what happens. But I don't think my wife is going to put up with it much longer. So <laughs> I'm enjoying it while I can. Ted, are you still out in Arizona? Yes, I'm out in, out in Gilbert, as you know, just outside of Phoenix. Starting you know, to eat you, up here. Well, I mean, it's, it's such a great place. And you've been there for a long, long time. And uh, your first year of retirement. I mean, you have been a major league umpire. Well, you, you started originally, and we'll get to this in a second, but you were in the Pacific Coast League, and then your major league debut comes in 94. You retire at the end of last year. What, what has retirement been like for you? I, I know you have a lot of other things uh, that you have going on, and we'll talk more about those, but, but just being away from the game day in and day out, what's it been like for you? Yeah, it's been, it's been a little surreal. You know, really in COVID, it was kind of a dress rehearsal for retirement as, you know, April and May came up and we weren't, we weren't out on the ball field. So, um, you know, and then when the season ended, when the playoffs ended, it was business as usual, November, December, January. Uh, once spring training hit, then it was kind of, okay, uh, you know, after all these years, you, you felt like you needed to get ready for spring training and uh, then once the season started, I've been loving it, not having to get on a plane every three days and not crisscrossing the country. It's been, uh, it's been fun. But I will say this. I feel like I'm busier than ever. I think uh, I need to go back on the road and uh, to rest a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. There's no doubt. You know, you, know you, you growing up, there was a lot of moving around. I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong here. You were born in the state of Washington, but you lived part of your life in New York. You lived another part of your life out in Mountain View, California. You went to high school and college out in California. So maybe that was just setting the tone of you uh, in your future endeavors and all the traveling you were going to do. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, I remember coming down to spring training in Arizona and I said, I really don't like this place. It's hot. It's the desert. It's not for me. And I ended up moving here in 1991 and I've been here ever since. When you first started, uh, you, you, you played, you know, you played uh, a lot of sports in high school. You played basketball, uh, captain of the football team, all this kind of thing. Um, you, 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 for a short while, an amateur boxer, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. And, and I, I assume you decided I got to get out of that in a hurry, right? Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I decided I was going to turn pro. You know, I was going to be heavyweight champion of the world and uh, mo actually moved to Las Vegas. I was there. I was sparring with some pros. Um, and that's really kind of where the umpire thing, I had, I had dabbled in umpiring. I had done some high school. I had some, done some little league and I met some guys that were minor league umpires. And my father actually offered to pay for me to go to umpire school. And I thought five weeks in Florida, uh, it's better than getting beat up down here in Vegas. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll go do it. And, uh, you know, from there, I just, I got hired and I went to the minor leagues and, uh, I still boxed a little bit, even while I was coming through the minor leagues, just to try to stay in shape, and and I loved it. But uh, I tell you, it, it was uh, umpiring was a lot better than boxing, and uh, yeah. You know that 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 Joe Brinkman um, umpiring school that you went to, I think you went back in the late 1980s. That thing was a big deal, man. I mean, I remember th those were the years I was working with Harry Carey in Chicago. And he would talk about it inevitably, it seemed like, every single series about what a big deal that school was. Talk about that a little bit. And is there anything still out there like that now? Yeah, well, you know, the, Joe Brinkman had a, a school there in uh, Cocoa Beach, in Cocoa, and uh, Harry Wendelstead had his over in Daytona. And, uh, you know, so those were the kind of the two competitors. They were really the – you had to go to one of those two schools to get into minor league baseball and – now it's a little bit different. Um, Harry Wendell said his past, and Hunter handles that school. Uh, his son, Major League umpire Hunter Wendell said. And then um, baseball also runs an academy in uh, Vero at the old Dodger Town. Yep. So you can go to one of those two and, and get yourself into baseball. As a matter of fact, we were just out in Cincinnati last month at the Youth Academy. What a, what a great place. Uh, MLB uh, umpire camp, and we're going to be out in Chicago at the end of this month. So people can come, prospective umpires, they can come to camp. They can uh, also maybe win a scholarship to the Umpire Academy down in Vero run by Major League Baseball. So, yeah, if someone's interested in, in uh, getting into umpiring, they can go to MLB.com and check out the umpire camps. 
You know, Ted, I, I, I still have a son who's playing high school athletics. And uh, here in Ohio, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about football, whether you're talking about baseball, basketball, lacrosse is a big growing sport, the whole nine yards, soccer, whatever it might be. They are begging for officials in this state. Uh, in, in fact, you know, I, I, I've given serious thought to, to going through the, the, the schooling on it to go do football or basketball because they need officials that badly. Are you seeing that in baseball across the country like we are here in Ohio? Yeah, absolutely. And it's really, it's really sad because I know uh, I've got some friends in other states. They're kids like yours playing high school ball. And they're getting games canceled. Uh, because there's not any umpires. They're getting games, you know, the JVs having to play on, uh, you know, a different day. I know in football, they're playing freshman football on Wednesdays, JV on Thursday, and varsity on, on Friday, just so they can get the officials to work the games. And that's terrible. Um, but, you know, it's people get abused verbally. Yep. Uh, you know, it's, it's so, you know, it, why would someone want to do it? You know, right? It's not worth the pay. It's not worth the headache. Uh, I know of several umpires uh, here in the Phoenix area that have been umpiring. You, you, you remember what it's like in Phoenix. You know, you're playing baseball year-round uh, with the travel ball and the weather's yep. so great in the winter. Um, and there's just not enough umpires to cover it. And a lot of guys that have been doing it for a long time are hanging up their gear saying, I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I want to deal with the hassle. And it's terrible. And so, you know, we're really trying to – I try to get out and recruit high school baseball players and um, junior college baseball players to get out and umpire. You know, it's a great job. It's a great way to supplement your income. Uh, I think it makes you a better player. You know, if you get back there behind the plate and call balls and strikes, it gives you the perspective of what the umpire thinks. And, um, you know, and then it's also something that if someone wanted to do it for a career or even as a, you know, a second job, you can do that um, as long as, uh, you know, well into your advanced ages. Yeah, yeah, so, and, 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 and I mean, I, I guess that would lend itself to the question, it, it, knowing the situ excuse me, the situation that we're in right now. I, look, I'm never going to say it's easy because there are thousands of guys, tens of thousands of guys out there that want to be a major league umpire one day. Uh, I, despite a shortage, there are still tens of thousands that do. But because of the shortage, would you say compared to when you were coming up, that the, the, the chances? at least are percentage-wise better to have that as a career than they've ever been? Yeah, I think you have less people going to umpire school now. Um, so, yeah, at the professional level, um, the odds are probably about the same uh, because you, you, all, you don't have that many openings. Uh, you know, last year, 10 of us retired. It was kind of a, uh, uh, an unusual year. Usually there's only one or two. But at the amateur level, you, you can progress up high into college baseball and, um, you know, the, the good high school baseball. And so, uh, yeah, I think people should take advantage of the fact that there's a shortage and really, um, really give it a try. And also, like, like you said, you could do football, you could do baseball, uh, you could do basketball. And a lot of minor league umpires supplement their income by doing high school basketball and wrestling. Um, yeah, for, you know, you get out there, get, do some training and get out and start doing it. Um, you know, umpiring, I know, is one of those things that you either love it or you hate it. So I would encourage everybody, give it a try. If you don't like it, maybe try to find another sport. If you do, there's plenty of, uh, there's, there's plenty of work for you. All right, let, let me uh, hit on a couple of things. Uh, I, strangely enough, the year you decide to retire is when all of a sudden Major League Baseball implements all these brand new rules. Uh, you still watch the game. You follow the game. You have a lot of friends who you worked with uh, uh, through all the many, many, many years, 30-plus uh, years as a uh, Major League Baseball umpire. What do you think of the rules, and, and what do your peers think about them? So as a fan, I think it's great because, uh, you know, the speed up rules, the game's going two and a half hours, uh, two hours and 40 minutes. Um, so the umpires that I talk to now, though, uh, they love it. They love being on the field less. It's going to be better on their bodies. Over a long grind of the season, it's going to be better. But like, uh, you know, Bill Miller said to me the other day, I saw him working the Diamondbacks game, and he said, you know, my, my game's only two and a half hours, but I still have the same workload. I'm calling the same number of pitches. I'm just kind of compressing it. And so they're telling me that it's more like a sprint now um, than a marathon. And so at the end of the game, they are, they're, they're happy that they're out of there at a decent hour, but they, they're worn out, especially working the plate. And these new rules just piled so much more responsibility on the umpires. 
you know, the disengagements, um, you know, the, you've got to now keep one eye on the clock, uh, all the different nuances that happen. We saw the other day with a catcher trying to call timeout to go to the mound and can he call time was the hitter alert to the batter. Um, it, it's just, you know, I think about when I came up, we put the gear on and went out and called balls and strikes and, and now it's just all the rules that have evolved. Mound visits, um, you know, the three pitcher minimum rule, all this stuff, which I like the rules, uh, but the amount of workload it puts on the umpire is, it's, it's really increased from, you know, 30 years ago. What would you say, Ted Barrett, to the fan out there who says, you know what, we should go to uh, electronic uh, calling of balls and strikes? What would you say to that? I would say, you know, you got to be careful what you wish for uh, because, you know, this is something that we've really looked at. We've looked at hard through our, through the umpires union. And, and look, a lot of people think we're against it because we, you know, we don't want it because we want to call balls and strikes. But the reality is we want what's good for the game. And, you know, if this is good for the game and it's better for the game, then, hey, let's do it. But if it's not, let's be careful what we're running into because, you know, it's hard to roll it back. It's like with replay. Um, which I'm all for replay on the basis. I think this that was a great thing. Uh, you know, we just lost Don Denkinger last week. Uh, you know, uh, just had the service for him. Um, one of the great umpires in Major League Baseball. And what is he known for? The the misplay in the 1985 World Series. Um, Jim Joyce, one of the great umpires that I got the pleasure to work with. Um, and what is he known for? The, the 27th out of the... Uh, Galarraga perfect game. And so replay would have fixed those, uh, but it also created some situations that we didn't anticipate, right? The guy sliding into second base and, you know, his, his hand comes off uh, by an inch and the fielder leaves a tag on him. Uh, those, I don't think those were things that, uh, that we wanted to happen. So with the electronic strike zone, to answer your question, it could solve some problems, you know, with being 100% consistent, um, you know, no human error, no umpire missing a pitch, but the technology also is not perfect. Uh, we see a lot of missed pitches, pitches that don't track. Some days the system doesn't work. So if we're gonna go into this, it's gotta be 100% ready to go. And I just don't believe it's there yet. So I wanna tell the fans, um, they keep screaming for it, but it's not ready yet. And when it is ready, then we can have that discussion if it's best for baseball or not. Um, it's kind of a long answer to your question. but No, uh, it's not. I but, I mean, you, you bring up a great point because you hear people scream and moan about it all the time. They talk about comparing. They draw the analogy to tennis where the ball, you know, did it hit the line? Was it off the line? You know where I'm going with all this. But, I mean, this is a whole different animal. Um, and, and, and I don't know. I'm with you. I I, I, I I've never trusted technology much to be able to hang with it. I mean, you get heat, you get weather conditions. Tennis, you rarely have that kind of thing where it's, it's really dramatic weather conditions. You'll get some hot days wherever, but th there's a lot going on there, and, and, and I've heard that it's not ready either. I want to get into some, um, some, some moments in your career because, you know, I used to say it all the time as a broadcaster, and I'm going to start with the Cubs, okay? I'm broadcasting for Fox the 2003 National League Championship Series, right? And, um, you know, you've got, you've got the, you know, the Cubs who have a chance to go to the World Series for the first time since 1945. They're ahead three games to two. They're at Wrigley Field. The crowd is – I've never seen anything like it in my life uh, for game six and then game seven. It was just beyond description. You were um, the crew. Uh, help me here. With, you were, if I'm not mistaken, behind home plate in game six when the Cubs won the first time World Series going way, way back, 1918 or something like that. When you're on the field, I, I know you're, you're staying impartial, and you're, but, but what do you remember about that? And was there something going through your mind where you're thinking, man, oh, man, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But but if, if the Cubs win this thing, I'm here to see this. Yeah, you know, during the game, you, as you said, um, we're not really thinking about that. You know, you're locked in. Uh, you're trying to get pitches right. Uh, I remember the kid for the Cubs threw, threw a great game. He really had good stuff that night. And um, – it's when the game is over and the Cubs clinch and they're going to the World Series. 
And I remember going into the locker room after, and the crowd was just going crazy. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, we might as well take our time because we're not going to get out of here anytime soon. But we went out on uh, – usually uh, when the game's over, we'll dress and eat and get out of there. But let's, let's go up on the field and kind of see what's going on. And looking at people uh, just – like they're they're embracing their Cubs fans are are you know hugging each other hugging each other and um, our clubhouse uh, clubhouse guy um, Tom yeah uh, was a retired yeah he's a retired uh, fireman and uh, he said hey can I bring my boys down you know as, as being the crew chief he was asked for permission I said yeah bring bring them down that's that's fine so they come down and so I'm standing on the field. And, um, you know, Tom and his boys are standing there and they're, they're crying and they're hugging each other. And um, the, one of his sons said, I wish Grandpa was here to see this. And it, it, it was really cool to see. You think about the generations of Chicagoans that yeah. connect over the Cubs and just all of their, um, you know, the, the, the lean years of being Cubs fans. And now here it, go, here it comes. They're going to the World Series. And... Uh, it was a really cool thing for me to see because you forget, as you know, when you go to the ballpark every day and it becomes a grind and then days turn into games turn into seasons, seasons turn into decades. And, um, you know, it, it's a job. It's punching the clock. And I forget what uh, this was a reminder of what baseball means to people, what following a team means to people, what uh, and the family connections. So that was a cool thing for me to see. And that's something I'll always remember. And I've always... As I got toward the end of my career, I remember to look around the stands and kind of soak that in and um, just see the beauty of that. You know, you were also around for the complete 180 of something like that, right? You worked the final game uh, as a second base umpire, I I believe, back in September of 2004 for the last ever game in Montreal. You know, for the people that were in the game, those uh, umpires, players, coaches, managers, broadcasters, staff, whatever it might be. Montreal was one of the great stops in, in, in all of baseball. But look, the stadium was old. It was tired. People weren't going to the games. They weren't spending any money on the franchise. What was that like to be there for the last game ever in Montreal? Yeah, you're right. The, going to Montreal, you always love to see it on the schedule. The city was great. Um, you know, the restaurants and, and just a great city to walk around, the old buildings. Uh, yeah, I, I loved it. Um, but yeah, the, the ballpark was subpar. Um, there weren't a lot of people there. There wasn't a lot of energy in the building. Uh, but I remember that last game and there was actually some fans there and they were really angry. <laughs> and I remember Frank Robinson was the manager of the Expos. And what's funny is earlier that day, I went golfing with a Alfonso Marquez, Alfonso's a crew chief now in the major leagues. And Dave Jackson, who's an NHL official, was an NHL official at the time. He's retired now. He took his golfing out of his club. And uh, I'm not a very good golfer, so I lost about, I don't know, a couple dozen of his golf balls. <laughs> and so we go out to the game that night, and the crowd's really angry. And at one point, um, in protest, they start firing golf balls on the field. Um, and just... You know, uh, Frank actually pulled pulled his team off. He said, I'm not going to leave my guys out there with people throwing golf balls. And I'm running around the stadium, grabbing them, putting them in my pocket, um, you know, on the turf there as they're rolling. And then we got together. Bob Dupay was there. Um, the commissioner wasn't there, but Bob Dupay was. And, you know, we actually talked about forfeiting the game because, uh, you know, the fans are, you know, just so unruly. And uh, which is strange because usually the fans – you know, they they didn't get too excited over uh, baseball because, you know, hockey being their sport. But at, at this point, um, we got the field cleared and the fans settled down and we got it. We went out and finished the game. Uh, but there was some some tension there. And I thought, how terrible would this be as a legacy for uh, the Expos if the last game had to be forfeited um, and we had to pull them off the field, which is something you never want to do as an umpire. But so the game was over. And, and after we get together with uh, Dave was there and, he came down to our locker room and uh, I handed him a, uh, about 30 golf balls. I said, here, I'm paying you back with interest. <laughs> so, <laughs> What's the most unruly situation? You ever been scared in a situation 
as a major league umpire? I mean, you talked about how they were unruly that night. Was there another time where you said, oh, man, or maybe a minor league game where you're like, this is not good? Well, there's been, uh, yeah, in the big leagues, we've had pretty good security. I know um, people uh, get a little bit unruly, but usually there there's a barrier between them and us. Um, there's been some times in the minor leagues, you know, working in the Cal League and Visalia and Bakersfield, parks like that, where if, uh, if the crowd's upset with you, it, it can be a tough walk to the car. Um, there's been some one night in San Jose, uh, you know, I had to kind of battle battle my way to the car with the crew. Um but uh, luckily, they, they, uh, I was usually bigger than most of them. So, uh, yeah, we, we, were able to, we were able to make it. <laughs> um, but I can remember um, a couple situations. You know, it was scary in St. Louis in the 2011 World Series. Uh, 2011, yeah, 2011, when they beat the Rangers in seven games. Um, apparently... People, not just people at the game, but fans flooded that stadium downtown and they ended up finding their way in. There was just this crush of people. I mean, there was thousands and thousands of people coming out to uh, to celebrate. And so that, that got to be dangerous because we were just literally pressed in with bodies, you know, and we got our wives there and our kids there. So we kind of just, we went out to the field and hung out on the pitcher's mound and security kept people away from that. So... Yeah, it wasn't like they were angry. They were, in this case, they were celebrating. Uh, but just the crush of the, the people, that, that got a little bit scary. Even walking downtown to the hotel, it was a, just a, a sea of people and, um, you know, trying to keep our group together and keep everybody safe. That was a little bit scary. Um, you uh, are the only umpire in the history of Major League Baseball, the only guy to be behind the plate for two perfect games. Now, again, people who work the sport, and I'm not trying to exclude any of our viewers on this thing, but, you know, when, when you watch baseball every single day, you know, I don't know if Matt Cain, uh, that was the second one you had. I mean, there was a time he was a really good pitcher. He wasn't this dominant guy like a Randy Johnson or somebody like that, right? You know, Johnson was one of those guys, and you've seen him. You, you know other guys. Where every time they took the mound, it would not be beyond a chance where they could throw a no-hitter. I don't know about a perfect game, but they had the kind of stuff. But, you know, when, when you're watching a game – and all of a sudden, you'll get to the fourth, and you'll get to the fifth. And then all of a sudden, there's this great defensive play made in the sixth or the seventh. And that perfect game or no-hitter is still going. Do you sense that a little bit when you're behind the plate on a game, going through a game like that? Yeah, it's funny because the the teams, the ball players, you can sense something's going on just by their behavior. And, you know, they're leaving the pitcher alone in the dugout, and nobody's talking. <laughs> there's no small talk. And there's, you know, they're, they now are feeling the weight of the moment defensively. And, um, you know, the, there's an intensity. Um, so even if you don't know what's going on, you look up at the scoreboard and say, oh, okay. I tell people with David Cohn's game, um, it was interesting because there was a rain delay after the third inning. And we walked off the field. And I said, Jim Evans was the crew chief. I said, Jim, we got to get back out there. He's got a perfect game going. And I was joking. Um, then as the game resumed and started going along against the Expos, actually, as we were talking about them earlier. And um, I remember looking up at the scoreboard in about the seventh inning saying, okay, there's something going on. I really didn't realize that he had a perfect game going. I saw that there was no hits on the scoreboard. And then I saw he was facing the minimum as they list the, the lineups in Yankee Stadium. But I'm trying to remember, was there a walk? Um, was there a double play? Did somebody get picked off? And when I walked off the field, uh, the late Chuck Merriweather put his arm around me. And I said, Chuck, was that a no-hitter or a perfect game? He said it was a perfect game. Um, and then now we'll fast forward to 2012 with Matt Cain. In about the fourth inning, um, I looked up, and I, oh, he's got a perfect game going. And so from then on, I knew it. And so the pressure's on there as an umpire because, you know, you don't want to call – uh, a ball a strike because people say, well, the umpire gave this to him. I um, mean, you certainly don't want to call a strike a ball and, and then have a base hit or a walk and, and then you miss a play that costs the perfect game. So there's a lot of pressure on you. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure on everybody. And, you know, the, the, I remember some of the great plays that were made in, in, the, uh, in the 
Kane perfect game. I mean, the Gregor Blanco caught a ball that, uh, you know, he had no business catching. Um, uh, Snyder, the Astros catcher, hit an absolute bomb uh, that, you know, I think it was a divine intervention that knocked that ball down and uh, was caught by the center field. I thought it was going to hit that glove out in San Francisco in left center. Um, but, you know, a touching story on that was uh, the, the following season, or I forget which year it was, was the year that Matt Cain retired. I came in to uh, San Francisco and I had two young guys with me. So I said, I'm going to move up and work the plate uh, in this series where I wasn't going to. So I went to first base and Buster Posey was playing first base that day. And he looked at me and said, did you plan this? I said, plan what? He said, uh, Kane's throwing tomorrow and it's his last game. He's going to retire. And so I kind of laughed. I said, are you catching? Yeah. So I get back there behind the plate. And Matt and I, uh, we knew each other, you know, just from coming up together. We hadn't sat and had many conversations, but I was very, you know, I was fond of him because I respected him, the way he played the game and the way he treated his teammates and the way uh, everybody, um, you know, loved him, which was, you know, says volumes uh, about his personality. So he's back there, you know, he's, he's, he was battling that year, some injuries. And so he's throwing uh, and, uh, you know, it's, that's one of those moments where I was like, okay, you got to stay locked in here, call a ball a ball and a strike a strike. Let's not, let's not expand the zone for Matt King. It was a meaningless game. I think uh, neither team was going to the playoffs or if they were, they'd already locked it up. So, um, you know, the temptation there is let's send Matt out with a great performance, but you can't do that as an umpire. With your integrity, you have to uh, remain completely neutral. But, I, you know, so I was fighting emotions for the first time in my career because, you know, in the fifth inning, he, 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 he Posted zero runs and he earned it. I didn't give him any of that. Uh, and as he was walking off the mound, everybody's cheering and crying. Or, you know, he's got some tears going. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I was like, man, don't. I'm fighting it back because I don't want to sit there and um, have the camera show tears running down my face. Yes, yeah. <laughs> getting yeah. sentimental. But yeah, I was able to stay in the moment. And then uh, afterward, uh, I was at third base and he came out and shook my hand and said, and I said, congratulations on a great career. And so, um, yeah, that was a, that was a, a memorable game. Day sure. For me. Now, the one I'm sure you're asked about on, on a semi-regular basis is, look, Bobby Cox was thrown out of more games than any manager in the history of the sport, right? 2007, mm -hmm. you're doing a game in August of that year. I think it was the Giants and the Braves. And you give Bobby the heave-ho. Ejection number 132, which breaks the all-time record formerly held by John McGraw. Now, when you're going into that game, everybody, all the umpires know that's the deal, right? And then all of a sudden, what happened? Was Bobby looking to get run? Did he want that record? No, it's, it's, it's funny because we went in there a couple of months earlier, and somebody said, oh, he only needs two more ejections or – you know, whatever the number was. And so we said, well, he might get that. Not to, he can't get him twice tonight. But <laughs> might get him the series is over. Um, and so now I'm back two months later, and I had no idea. I assumed he had already been, you know, and this people laugh. They, they say, how do you not know what's going on? But in the umpire world, again, we just we show up, do the game. We try not to read the media stuff. We try to be aware if there's something special. You know, they'll mark baseballs. And, like when guys are chasing milestones and home runs and things like that. But we, I really didn't know. And uh, so we got on the – I thought certainly he would have been ejected by now uh, plenty to, to cover the record. But I, I feel like I cheated the Braves fans because um, I ring up Tripper Jones on a pitch. He goes back to the dugout. He flung the bat on me, which, you know, I probably should have ejected him there. But um, and now he's in the dugout, and now he's really upset because I think he went back and looked at it and saw that it was inside. And so Bobby's going to – one of the great thing about Bobby, he was going to jump on the grenade. He was not going to let his player get tossed. I'll do it. So he starts yelling at me from the dugout, and, and uh, I hold up, you know, give him – no, don't do that, Bobby. Uh, he continues. I eject him. Well, it happened between innings. And, and Bobby came out instead of yelling and screaming and throwing things. He came out and talked to me very, you know, calmly, sanely. Um, so I think it looked to people like we were just having a discussion. And then he leaves, uh, and then they come back from commercial break. And as you know, 
from doing it so long and so well. It's like sometimes you got to figure out what happened between innings. <laughs> right, right. And go back and look at it. And, you know, the announcers are saying, we think Bobby's been ejected by Ted Barrett. Uh, and then they finally found it and figured it out. But there was no huge fanfare. There was no kicking of dirt. There was not a whole lot of cussing and screaming and throwing of things or spitting. It was just kind of a calm discussion and see you tomorrow. But that was the great thing about Bobby Cox uh, because he would get ejected. Uh, it was never personal. Same thing with Lou Pinella. I mean, I ejected Lou many times. Um, and, it, you know, it, 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 there's yelling, there's screaming, there's histrionics. Uh, but the next day, it's like nothing happened. They bring the lineup card out. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Um, I remember a couple of Bobby Cox stories. I was working in Arizona. You were doing the game. Um, and Tony Randazzo threw him out. Bobby was sticking up for his pitcher. And I went down to use the restroom between innings. And Bobby was down there smoking a cigar. <laughs> and uh, he said, hey, how you doing, Teddy? I said, I'm, I'm good, Bobby. Uh, he said, yeah, tell Tony, you know, I just had to stick up for my guys. You guys have a good night. And another time, uh, we were in Atlanta and working with Tim McClelland, a uh, longtime veteran umpire, um, well-respected umpire. And he, he threw Bobby out. And that night, we went to McKendrick's in Atlanta. And um, there was a bottle of wine there that the, the Mater D came over and said, hey, Bobby uh, said he wanted you to guys enjoy a bottle of wine on him. Uh, so, you know, those are the type of things that, you know, it was, especially with the older guys, it was a business. It was, um, you know, they were taking care, of, but also keeping the relationship with us. Um, and there was mutual respect. And I've got a ton of respect for both Bobby and Lou. And, and so... Uh, yeah, that's um, that's something that you know you see on TV with with it looks like they're really upset and really mad, and sometimes they are, but a lot of times they're just uh, doing what they have to do to manage their ball club. You know, Ted, I I, I I miss those those guys. I miss the personalities. You know, whether you're talking yeah. about Lasorda uh, uh, all those years, or you're talking about Lou, or you're talking about Bobby Cox. I'm not going to say all of these guys because it would be unfair of me to say that. But it seems like now we, we've almost reached a point of cookie cutter kind of guys, where they're either they're afraid to show emotion, they're not allowed to show emotion, they don't want to show emotion. And so it, it's become, in a lot of ways, an emotionless sport, which I think hurts the sport. Did you, you know, as you got here to these last number of years and you saw that old guard start to change? Uh, the Tony LaRusses and some of those guys. Do, do you miss those guys? Or, or were you like, man, I, you know, look, I loved them, but I had enough of it. Well, you know, it, was, it, it has become sanitized. Um, and sometimes, you know, we knew, we knew our role and we knew it was good for the game. People like to see that, uh, the jawing and the, uh, you know, the, the back and forth. Um, and again, it wasn't personal. It was, you know, we, we were playing a role. They were playing a role. Um, yeah, sometimes they were genuinely mad, and we were genuinely mad. Don't get me wrong. But we knew it was kind of the confines of the game, and then the next day it would be forgotten and over. Sometimes a uh, manager would apologize. Sometimes we had to apologize. Hey, took it too far. Sorry about that. Um, there's not much of that anymore. Now it's, um, you know, now it's a lot of passive-aggressive stuff. Um, you know, they're mad because of a call you had, and now a few days later they're still mad. You know, we just kind of got it off our chest. It's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my late 50s now. Uh, my brothers and I, when we were kids, I grew up with three brothers and a big dog. So we we're fighting all the time. You know, it's fisticuffs in the morning, but, uh, you know, then you're best friends again a few hours later because you were able to get that out of your system. Sure. Right? And now I just think there's just a whole lot of things that bubble up because they don't get it out of their system. They don't snap one time and then say, hey, all right, sorry, let's move on. Uh, now it's just like it all bottles up. And, uh, and and it really, so there's a whole lot of tension there that just never gets released. And um, I think that's part of the problem. Maybe we need to go back to just letting it fly once in a while. Yeah. And, um... <laughs> I, I'm with you all the way. I mean, I, I think that's probably true in a lot of walks of life uh, these days, uh, truth be told. Um, before I ask you what you're doing now, um, if there's one rule out there 
that perhaps fans misunderstand more than any other rule. You watch baseball day in and day out. You know, you'll hear announcers say, or you'll hear fans say, I- I'm just giving an example. This might be the answer, might not be the answer. But say the check swing. And they'll say, well, he never broke his wrist. You know, you hear that all the time, right? You've heard that 50,000 times, 5 million times. What What's the one rule out there, whether it be new or whether it be just an old rule that's just misunderstood? The most misunderstood rule. Is there one? I think one of them is uh, people think, oh, he's running out of the baseline. But, uh, you know, actually the, the runner establishes his own baseline. And it's when the, when the player tries, attempts to make the tag, did he deviate from the baseline that he established? You know, you don't draw a line from first to second. Uh, the other rule that's largely misunderstood is the uh, running out of the runner's lane, running to first base. If you remember back to the 2019 World Series, the uh, Washington's playing Houston, and I think it was Trey Turner was game six. Sam Holbrook calls him for running out, and it's actually uh, not interfering with the throw. It's interfering with the first baseman's ability to make the play. So I heard from everybody, oh, the throw came from third base. That shouldn't have been interference. And I happened to be in town for uh, negotiations. And... I saw a lot of very smart baseball people that know the game, and all of them uh, were just screaming about this call and how it should not have been made. The reality is when you draw this, you try to draw this play up at umpire school to simulate it, to get uh, students to to realize, um, you know, what's interference and what's not interference. This is a textbook play to teach a young umpire at umpire school. This is interference. What I'm saying is, there was no doubt to any umpire that the call was correct. And yet the whole baseball world was up in arms at this, uh, thinking that it was a, a terrible call, and it wasn't. So that showed me how misunderstood that rule is. Uh, another thing is, you know, obstruction and interference. You know, one thing I always respected about you in the booth is that you always uh, tried to, um, you know, know the rules and educate yourself so you can educate the viewers. And as umpires, we appreciate that when, uh, announcers do their best to uh, to try to be accurate when they talk about rules. So it's, it's complex. The rule book's complex. There's a lot of nuances. No one can know everything. We always have to brush up and study, and uh, but that's our jobs. Um, it's amazing also how many major league uh, players and managers who've been around forever misunderstand the rules a yes, lot as yes. well. Yes, I've, I've, said, I've said that a thousand times. It amazes me how many guys, and believe me, I didn't know all the rules. I mean, I happen to sit next to guys who really know the rules, whether it was Chris Welsh. As you know, you've done a lot, a lot of work with Chris on, on, on rules and the Rules Academy website. Bob Brenly knew the rules very, very well. Uh, so I was always leaning on those guys. But it, it, it never ceased to amaze me in baseball and in football a lot how the head coaches or the managers or the players themselves don't know the rules. And there are so many areas that I've always felt like strategically, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, where you could take advantage of those rules to help yourself perhaps steal a run or steal a play in a game. Yeah, definitely. If the, the more you know uh, about the nuances, yeah, there's, there's chances you can maybe get a run. Um, that that uh, people wouldn't look at. There's things that, you know, there's certain pickoff moves that I'm surprised that more teams don't do um, uh, because they can do them legally. And, uh, yeah, I think being able to uh, really know the rule book inside out is a big advantage, especially as a manager. And like you said, a lot of managers do know the rules pretty well. Um, and, you know, the guys that have been around forever are the ones that they – because they've seen it. And yeah. if they remember it, make notes on it, uh, they're able to take advantage of it later. All right, last thing I want to ask you about is what you're doing now. You decided to retire. Uh, you end up getting a master's degree in biblical studies from Trinity College and Seminary. Uh, you get a doctorate in theology with an uh, emphasis in pastoral ministry. What, what you, You've written a book about this. Uh, it, the title is An Investigation of Faith as a life principle in the lives of major league umpires. What, what, obviously, your faith led you in that direction. It's one thing to say you want to go do it. You actually went out and did it. How did you come to that point in time? Well, you know, uh, when I got to the big leagues, as I went through the minor leagues, got to the big leagues, there's great organizations like Baseball Chapel and 
and uh, some other ones, Pro Athletes Outreach and UPI, but they, they're really geared toward the players and they, they do it well and they, and they should be. But there was nothing really for um, the umpires. And so what well, we found at Calling for Christ, which is a um, ministry for umpires, uh, professional umpires, major league umpires and minor league umpires. And uh, we just kind of walked through it together. Um, life on the road, things being hard, uh, the mistakes that some of the older guys made, we try to keep the younger guys from going down that road. Uh, and just having a faith community, really, that's the thing, connection. Uh, umpiring is a lonely job. In the minor leagues, there's, in the low minor leagues, it's two man, as, or two person, you and another person, you're out there um, working the plate one day, the base is the next. Hope you have a good partner that you get along with because you're going to be with them all year. Uh, we roomed together when I was in the minor leagues. They get their own rooms now, so there's some of an improvement. But long car rides, and it can be very lonely. Uh, if you get double A, there's uh, you know you work three person, and then in the big leagues, obviously there's there's four of us. But still, um, you know it's it's a lot of uh, uh, time on the road, um, a lot of time away from family, and so. Um, we just try to keep a community. Technology is great like this. We do some, uh, some Bible studies over Zoom. We do a prayer call uh, once a week with the big league guys and the minor league guys. And uh, spring training, we have some studies in person. Uh, just trying to keep our community connected and for those that, uh, that want to participate in that. And we've got, we do a retreat every year. We get good attendance on that. It's a chance just to come together, um, study God's word and build friendships and support. Well, Ted, you're a good man. I, I've known you for a long, long time. I've always just thought the world of you. Uh, you were great at your job. I, I, I have no doubt you're great at the job you're doing now. You're even doing a little work for MLB Network as a rules analyst and all that kind of thing. So good for you. Can't thank you enough for your time today. And all the best, my friend. Godspeed ahead. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, and now that I'm doing a little TV, you always made it look so easy. It's oh, yeah. not that easy. <laughs> no. I, <I'm, laughs> I need some pointers here. Well, no, you're doing just fine. I think Chris helped you. You guys doing those videos together. You're just getting you warmed up for that whole thing. Because those are great videos. I would go to BaseballRulesAcademy.com where you did a lot of different videos about a lot of different rules that I think even the most hardcore fan or high school or college umpire might think they know, you know, a situation that maybe how they would handle it and never seen it before. It, it is great stuff. And I loved watching those things as Chris was putting them together and you guys were shooting them. So thank you for your time, uh, Ted. God bless, buddy. Great to see you. God bless you, brother. Let's do it again sometime. I look forward to it. Ted Barrett, kind enough to join us and talk everything. It's been, that's some fascinating stories, man.